Salutations. Greetings and salutations officially. Yep. I mean that. Uh, it's not just a saying. I just I like the way that sounds and I like to say it. So um, So we'll continue tonight um, on the course we've been on. We've uh, been cutting through the uh, confession. And we'll continue to do it tonight. We'll speak about Article 30, uh, Reconciliation, and 31, Human Afflictions. So um, I hope that will be beneficial to all of us. And as normal, let's uh, open up with a word of prayer. You know, there's so much to pray about, isn't there? I mean, just, just the things that take place in our world, just, just uh, there's so many things that we should to me there's so many things that just don't make sense and they don't make sense because they're not in line with God's word and just sometimes wonder why um, so and I know the reason but why so many people will run so far away from the truth and just um, try to try to see how fast they can go to hell I don't know how else to say it but anyway let's open up with a word of prayer our Father and our God, again, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for who you are. And we thank you for who our Savior is. And we thank you for who we are in him to you. Thank you, Lord, for our salvation. We confess how little we appreciate and recognize and respond to such a great work in our own lives that you've taken us from, from rebellious sinners and have by your power and your grace granted us newness of life father as we gather together tonight we do pray for the situations around the world lord so many in sorrow so many in pain so many hurting so many in in darkness lord both uh, mostly spiritually lord so many people call good evil and evil good so we pray lord you be merciful we pray you be gracious lord we pray that your hand would would save, Lord, that, that you would bring many to yourself before that great and terrible day. For in that day, um, the door will be shut, the goats will be separated from the sheep, and Lord, you have said that your righteous judgment will be poured out. So to that end tonight, Lord, may we be sober, but may we be joyful in the truth as it is in Christ. Bless our thoughts, bless our words, bless our fellowship. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so as I said, um, the first half will be Article 30, which is reconciliation. It's a rather short article in the Confession, so we certainly can handle uh, reading it and kind of maybe dissecting it a little bit, but I want us to uh, at least read it. It's on page 17, if you have the Confession, uh, Article 30, which again, uh, the term reconciliation has been added in as it seems to be that which the brothers are talking about. So the article says this, all believers through the knowledge of that justification of life given by the Father and brought forth by the blood of Christ have as their great privilege of that new covenant, peace with God, and reconciliation whereby they that were afar off are made nigh by that blood and have peace passing all understanding, yea, joy in God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the atonement. And so as I said, in my time tonight, I want to simply, well, I will say I want to look at a bunch of scriptures. I don't know if we'll get through all of them, but I think I, I'll have enough time to at least make the point uh, of what I'm trying to set forth. But uh, let me say it this way. Um, we have been going through, as of late, especially when we talked about justification, and we talked about sanctification, and now we're going to talk about um, reconciliation, and we're talking about the things that, um, to many people, are very difficult to understand, and, and I want us to try to think of it this way, that um, we ought not to make we ought to make a distinction between what justification is, sanctification, reconciliation, glorification. We ought to make clear distinctions of what the scriptures give to us concerning these truths, but, but I would 
ask us to remember that they, they are all close relatives, if, if, if I could use that term. In other words, you, you can't really separate them from each other because they are all within the, the redemption that is in Christ. They're just different ways in which uh, God gives it to us in, in, in different actions. So I want us to think about that as we go through this. Uh, reconciliation is not just a, a, a topic or a, a doctrine that's floating out there in, in spiritual uh, ozone somewhere, and it's all by itself, because it's not. It's vitally connected, even as we have been going through the doctrines of grace, and, and we've been, and I hope everybody understands, at least at this point, that what we had continually said, will continually say, is that you can't separate them. They're inseparable. They're, they're linked together. Um, that, that the tulip is not just, that they didn't just pick the tulip uh, to use because uh, it was just a fancy word or a nice word or a, 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 a nice thought, but because it represented really a chain of thoughts. And that if, if you don't have total depravity, as we say often, if you don't have total depravity fixed, perseverance of the saints really d doesn't make sense. So again, I just wanted us to think about that. Okay, so as we look at the article, um, it, it, the, the brothers thought this way, all believers through the knowledge of that justification of life given by the Father and brought forth by the blood of Christ. And I wanted to ask us to think about this in the very beginning was the way they open it up and they say all believers. So when you think about it, um, whatever reconciliation is, it is something that is given or is something that is a possession of all believers. And, and I think it's important that we remind ourselves of that, that we realize that the truths in the Word of God are for all believers, not only those who... Um, Sometimes I think people think that some of the truths in the Bible are only good for the really spiritual people. And, and that the rest, um, you know, it, it, they, they kind of suffer. The, the, it's so important, especially these, these great doctrines of justification and sanctification and certainly reconciliation, that we realize that every single believer has been reconciled to God. And, and, and if we don't understand it that way, we don't understand it not only in its individual aspect, but in its corporate aspect, I think we're going to miss what's really behind that truth. And so um, I think that's why, in a sense, they say all believers, and, and they will repeat that word all, and it's so important. Again, um, do we really believe that every single child of God has the same positional relationship with God? Now, that does not mean that at times some of God's children please him in, in a way that at times others might grieve him. And I'm not discounting that. I'm not just saying that that doesn't take place. But I think it's important for us to understand that these, these great and glorious truths that God has given to us apply to all of us. That, that there's no second tier child of God. Right? And, and, and again, I think sometimes we put people or we put uh, positions on pedestals that God doesn't. And I think we need to be careful about that. Certainly, I would think that, uh, and, and you'll hear it, people will say, well, he's a very religious man. He must be close to God. And, and in one sense, that could very well be true, right? But in another sense, he, he's no closer to God than, than, if you will, the worst saint in the world. Right? Well, positionally, we've all been reconciled to God. So as we kind of open up this thought of reconciliation, I wanted to, to keep that in mind um, and ask us to think about it, that it applies to all of us, young, old, um, really spiritual, somewhat spiritual, not very spiritual, or um, in the doghouse, as we would like to maybe term it. But then it says this, says all believers through the knowledge of that justification of life given by the Father and brought forth by the blood of Christ has, uh, have as their great privilege of that new covenant peace with God. Now if you remember last week when Brother Keith was speaking about uh, sanctification, he continually mentioned how the brothers have continually mentioned the new covenant 
And certainly, I think it's one of the reasons, and you might not agree with me, that one of the reasons why we adopted this confession was because of their understanding and their uh, forwardness about the new covenant. Again, if you look at the, the 1689 confession, um, although it's, it's in there, it's, it's a little bit hazy because it kind of mimics the, the Westminster Confession, but, but that's another discussion. But my point is that as we think about reconciliation, and again, uh, we'll take a minute to define it a little bit in a little bit, but I want us to think about how this thought of reconciliation is, is tied into the New Covenant. And I wanted to show it to you. So I'm going to ask you, turn to Jeremiah 31, which is one of the great passages that speaks about the new covenant, right? Jeremiah 31. And I wanted to read a couple of verses, and I wanted to continually make the point that I made that whatever reconciliation is, that it applies to all, and that in the new covenant, there's a, um, there, is a, there is a reality of it in its totality uh, in its totality and not just in um, individuals so let me just read it. it's very quick Jeremiah 31 31 behold the days are coming says the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt my covenant which they broke though I was a husband to them says the Lord I want you, now I want you to, to focus in on a couple of words as we go through this. Behold, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, says the Lord. I will put my law, where? In their minds. And write it on whose heart? Their hearts. Who? Everyone that's in the new covenant. Right? And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest, for I will forgive, look, their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. The new covenant um, and all the truths that come out of the new covenant, we, we must always have in our minds that th this application as it pertains to all of God's elect. And again, that plays into a lot of practical living in our lives, which I think one of the reasons why I think we struggle with our practical Christianity is because we don't understand that very point that we are not only in union with God individually, but we're in union with each other. And, and that, that leads us to be able to live with each other in a community um, in a very real aspect. So I wanted to at least mention to that. Mention that. Okay. Reconciliation. That's the what has been uh, put into parentheses. What is reconciliation anyway? And it says that uh, as their great privilege of that new covenant, peace with God and reconciliation. Reconciliation. What does that mean? Anybody? And, and I don't, please don't try to give me some Great doctrinal statement, because uh, you'll probably mess it up. <laughs> Give me something simple. What, when you think of reconciliation, what do you think about? Being taken back. Someone takes you back. Okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, here's a real good hint, right? Look. It says, and reconciliation. Look what the next few words say. Whereby those who were, what? Afar off are made nigh by the blood. And I think one of the simplest ways to define reconciliation is um, to distinguish it that way, that it is, um, if you will, the removal of us being aliens, enemies, strangers, and bringing us back into fellowship and friendship with God. That that really is the essence of reconciliation. Justification is our standing before God. It's God declares us righteous in Christ. And then there's the reality of sanctification. Reconciliation is that we who, and that's just the way they put it, and those are the scriptures I want to look at for a few minutes, that reconciliation is the removal of alienation or the removal of hostilities and 
not only a removal of it, but a renewal of friendship and fellowship. And in, this, in reconciliation, we have been reconciled to God. We who were in his enemies, and we'll look at a couple of scriptures on that, we are now, not only are we the children of God, we're in fellowship with him. We're in communion with God. So reconciliation is a great and, and glorious truth. It's the, it's the thing that people don't have. <laughs> How's that? The, the, and remember what it says in Isaiah? It says, there is no peace, saith my God, to who? Unto the wicked, right? And, 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 and that, al that alienation, their standing before God as enemies will not allow friendship and fellowship because God's of pure eyes than to behold evil. And, and in that sense, even as the psalmist say, and we could try to dilute it all we want, says God hates all the workers of iniquity. So when you think about that. So what I want to do, just for a few minutes, i got a few minutes left, I want to look at some scriptures that will reinforce this thought um, that reconciliation is the removal of the alienation that we had because of sin and bringing us back into friendship and fellowship with God. And not just in that sense with the Father, but with, through the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. It's the opposite of being enemies. So let me, let me direct you a couple of scriptures. If you could follow, that's great. If not, just listen. Go to Colossians 1 for a minute. And, and this is a theme that the apostle continually uh, picks up in his epistles. And I think it's interesting to see how he uh, lays it out in, in the very first chapter of Colossians. And you'll see, as we read a couple of them, these key words that keep coming up. In Colossians chapter 1, in verse 21, it says this. And you, who were once, look at the words, alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. So they're, they're, reconciliation is the opposite of being alienated and enemies. Okay? Here's another one. Go to Ephesians. We'll go back to Ephesians chapter 2 for a minute. And I, again, I wanted to demonstrate this. This is not just an isolated thought, but this is a thought that the apostle uh, keeps uh, in the forefront as he writes to the churches. In Ephesians chapter 2, in, I want us to look at verse... Um, 13. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been made near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace who has made both one, has broken down the middle wall of division between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that was between uh, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create one new man uh, from the two, thus making peace. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Again, and, and there's, there's different contexts here it, it, we could discuss, but I still think the point will, will stand that reconciliation is the removal of being enemies Aliens, aliens, strangers, in opposition to God, to being brought into fellowship and, and communion with God. Here's another one in Romans chapter nine, Romans chapter five. For all familiar passages, friends, but when you link them together like this, I think these points uh, grow larger and larger. In Romans chapter five, in verse nine, it says this. I'll read from verse eight. God demonstrates His own love towards us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in in God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. There it is again. Again, we not only, um, our standing before God is not only uh, taken care of, 
but, but, but the fellowship and the communion that comes with it has it, also been taken care of through the Lord Jesus Christ to bring us into union. Remember when Jesus said, I and the Father are one, and, and the Father is in me, and I and the Father, and, and you and me, and, and, and this whole idea of union, friendship, fellowship, right? It's kind of hard to um, be friends with someone while you're their enemy at the same time. Although I guess there's that saying, what is it saying? Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. <laughs> <laughs> um, think of it from the new creation. He, he, all, all things pass away, behold, all things have become new. We've been reconciled to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been brought into friendship. How many of us really think that God is our friend, by the way? Mm. Right? I think we think, we know God is our God. We know God is our Lord. We know God is our man. You had brought it up, even talking about Abraham being the friend of God. Well, guess what? We, we are in, having been reconciled by the blood of Christ, we have friendship with God. We have fellowship with God. We have been reconciled, and now we are friends. And again, it's the opposite of being an enemy. It's the opposite of being a stranger. It's the opposite of being an alien. Listen, um, if someone comes knocking at your door and you don't know him or her, tell me you're not a little skeptic about letting him in your house. And I know there's no worries with you because you got, you got protection in every pocket. I know, I know. <laughs> but, um, but it's different when it's a friend. It's different when it's when you know and you have fellowship with someone. Then you open the door wide open. Come on in, right? Because the, that union has already been established. That friendship, that fellowship has already been established. And, and, and that's what we have, brothers and sisters. That's what we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. It, it, and that's where I think a lot of people miss the reality of their salvation that it's more than just a, a, a legal standing. And honestly, it's more than just that I'm gonna be with God in heaven. I'm, God is my friend now. And, and I'll tell you what, and we were talking about this the other day, we were talking about it for a different reason. But I remember, especially when I was, um, not that I'm not in the ministry now, but, but you have few friends in the ministry, by the way. And if you don't think that's true, uh, try the ministry. You'll find out. You have very few friends because there's this, uh, because of a lot of reasons, and that's, I don't want to go into too many of them, but my point is, friends, we are the friends of God. And if we're the friends with God, we ought to be friends with one another, yeah. right? The, the two kind of go together. And so I just, I'm going to mention a couple of Proverbs and, and something, uh, another scripture that talks about it and consider how great a truth this is as they lay it out and they say that we have, um, we who were afar off have now have peace that passes all understanding, yea, joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement. You remember that proverb that says that um, there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother? Right? Well, guess what? Ultimately, who is that friend that sticks closer to the, than the brother? It's the Lord Jesus, right? He, he's not only our Lord, and again, never to be taken in an irreverent way, but not only is our Lord and our master and the captain and the author and finisher of our faith and the, the, the high priest and, and all the other truths, he's our friend. And he's the friend that sticks closer to, than a brother. In Proverbs 17, it says this. It says, a friend loves at all times. That's Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loves at all times. And I thought of that, and I thought of what Jesus said, where he said, I will never, what? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Well, isn't that the mark of a friend? Isn't that a mark of, of being in union with someone? That, and again, I would think that we all would have a short list maybe some have a long list, but I think it would be short in the end of the day of people that you know, friends that you have that you could call at any time about anything 
and know that they will be there. Those friends are hard to come by and those friends are great to have, right? But it says that a friend loves at all times and because of this reconciliation that's ours, God will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will stick close to us. In Proverbs 27, uh, 17, it says this, as iron sharpens iron, so a man's so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And I thought about that, and I thought about the work of the Spirit of God. That iron sharpens iron, and so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend, and how the Holy Spirit has been what? Given to us, not only as a seal, but also as a comforter, a teacher, a guide, a friend. And just think about that. You and I can call upon our friend anytime. You and I ought to call up on our friend anytime. The problem is, too often we call on the wrong kinds of friends. Remember what James says? That those that be what? Friends of the world? Can't be friends with God. So, so you see, if you're not a friend with God, then there is no reconciliation. If there is no reconciliation, then you have nothing to look forward to but the righteous, just condemnation of God. So think about that. Think about how these truths... I often think about, and I know that's one of the things when I first came here that attracted my thoughts was you guys at that time running around with the t-shirts, Theology Matters, you know, and... and I don't see it too often anymore. But, but you know how people will say theology doesn't matter? Do you know why people say theology doesn't matter? Because they don't know theology. <laughs> That's the truth. Because if they understood, if they understood these great doctrines, justification, sanctification, glorification, if they understood the, the, the depravity of man and unconditional election and the atonement and irresistible grace and the perseverance of saints, if they understood the great and glorious truths that are revealed in God's word about the union of the body of Christ, that's all theology, right? That's all the study of, of God. It draws us into further friendship, not only with God, but with one another. That's, what, that's why so many people, I think one of the reasons why so many people do not align themselves with a local church is they're not really right with God. And if you're not really right with God, you're going to have an awful hard time being right with God's people. You're going to have an awful hard time being friends with God's people. And, and you and I have met them, right? I, I, I know many people in particular tell me, uh, I don't need to go to church to be, you know, the whole story. I don't need to be church, go to church, to be a Christian. And, and I don't really like those church people anyway because they're all a bunch of hypocrites. But really, if you can't be friends with God's people, what makes you think you're the friends of God? Have you really been reconciled to God? So it's just something to think about as we go through uh, these different doctrines. And, and I trust that, that we will grow in that grace too. That we will, um, even as Peter said, grow, go, grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Son of God who, what, so loved us that he gave himself for us. So, all right, that's my time. And now Brother Keith will come and deal with uh, the next article.